Bible study time <clears throat> again book of James if you'll open your scriptures with me back in James chapter 4 James chapter 4 we spent uh, our last session our last class in one single verse a verse that uh, I believe deals with the Holy Spirit of God now we're ready for James 4, verse number 6. We're just going to work our way through verses 6 and 7 and 8 uh, as long as time will allow. Verse 6 is classic. But he giveth more grace. He giveth more grace. And the idea there is that God gives more and gives and gives more grace. He is a grace-giving God. Preacher, what is grace? Grace is that which got me saved. For by grace are you saved. There'd be no plan of salvation apart from God's grace. I believed, I trusted, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be. But it's all by grace through that faith. Grace not only got me saved, grace, grace. I, I read this. There is not only saving grace, I need an amen. There is sustaining grace. Grace helps me live for Jesus every single day. It's not my strength. It's strength God gave me and he gave it to me by means of his grace. God's unmerited favor. Paul said, and what a... What a Christian he was. Paul said, I am what I am by the grace of God. God's grace empowered him. God's grace helped him serve faithfully. And I've got some good news. He gives more grace. You need more grace today? Just like he gives wisdom and upbraideth not, he'll give you grace, grace, grace. In John 15, where the Lord is talking about our abiding in Him like the branch abides in the grapevine. And He says if we'll abide Him, we will bring forth fruit. And then a couple verses later, more fruit. A couple verses later, much fruit. Fruit, more fruit, much fruit. I hear echoes of that. He's given me grace. Then He's given me more grace. Hallelujah. Then He's given me much grace. God giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. God has never given a proud man grace, not saving grace. In order to experience the saving grace of God, will I get an amen? You've got to be under conviction. You've got to be lowered, humiliated. You've got to realize you're a sinner on your way to a devil's hell. You've got to realize you can't help yourself. You need Jesus as your Savior. God, God resisteth, resisteth, excuse me, the proud. The proud is the man who stuck up. He is uh, vain, elevated in his estimation of himself. He is the uh, proverbial self-made man. He is what he is because of his intellect and uh, his initiative and his power. You know, he's proud. And God resisted the proud. Remember Proverbs 6, we studied it. These six things does God hate, yea, seven are abomination unto him. And the top of the list, a proud look. God hates pride. Maybe because the first sin ever committed, the devil, Lucifer, once an angel of God committed, he tried to rebel and put his throne above God's throne. Pride. Pride in our new sin to the universe ultimately to the human race. God 
resisteth the proud. You will never get your prayers answered if you're a proud man or a proud woman. Resist it. Antitasso. It is a military word. Literally says God gets in the face of. God rebukes. God will not condone pride. Antitasso. God says to pride, humble yourself. Get in your place over there or you'll end up carrying your owner to hell. God resisted the proud, but he giveth grace. He giveth grace to the humble. The Holy Spirit, we've got scripture, the Holy Spirit will only teach the humble man. The word of God will only be, will only be, in, 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 uh, how do I want to say it, in, um, personalized, placed deep down in the heart of a man who is willing to say, I know nothing, I'm ignorant, I need the Holy Ghost as my teacher, the humble man. God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. A word there for humble means something like this, depressed. Now, I'm not talking about emotionally, he's crying and, and having a nervous breakdown, not that kind. The weight of life has come down on him heavy, humble. Now, we do know, and we'll see it, we can humble ourselves. We can set ourselves down in a corner or out on the balcony like where I'm sitting right now and, and say, Bagwell, you're nothing. You're a nobody. You're a no sinner saved by grace. And were it not for God's goodness in your life, you'd probably already be in hell. Humble yourself. Bring yourself down. Don't let you think too highly of yourself. God resisted the proud. God actively, actively will oppose the proud man. Let not that man think he'll receive anything of the Lord. But oh, how God will give and give and give his favor, his blessings, his love, and his mercy to the lowly man. That's a good synonym, to the lowly man. The man who will take himself and will you allow me pull himself down to where he ought to be. I am a human. I worship an almighty God. I know nothing. He knows everything. I am a peon. He is the Lord. God giveth grace to the humble. But it may not only mean just the man who has humbled himself. The man who has been humiliated by the circumstances of life. Well, Brother Bagwell, what does that mean? Who has been humiliated? Other people have hated him. Other people have made fun of him. Like the poor man in church that day, back in James chapter 2, a wealthy man came in and they said to the poor man, would you sit over there in the corner? Or would you get down here at my feet, at my footstool? And somebody that has been so belittled by the world. God loves that man. God will take up for that man. God will take care of that man. Oh, he giveth more grace. God, I don't deserve it. But oh Lord, I'll take all the grace you'll pour out on me. Grace, more grace, much grace. And he's always, he's always delighted to so bless his children. God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. We need to study. There is a writer, Andrew Murray by name, who wrote a book, an entire book on humility. I saw that book online free the other day. You could read it. I, I, you'll just have to use a search engine and find it. Humility. Well worth reading. We need to learn the traits of humility and assume them. Oh, I'll tell you one way to get humility. The fullness of the Holy Ghost, the fruit of the Spirit will produce meekness, lowliness, humility. Oh, how humble is the Holy Ghost. He never brags on himself. He never uplifts himself. The Holy Spirit of God always, the Holy Spirit of God invariably magnifies Jesus, uplifts, glorifies the Lord Jesus, and he will impart that trait 
into my life and into your life. Let me go to verse number 7 because it really ties into 6. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. These sounds like little short Proverbs. James is the equivalent of the book of Pro what Proverbs is to the Old Testament. In many ways, James is to the New Testament. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. He uses that tosso verb again. Just like God resists the proud, pops them real good, military word, armament word, battle word, warfare word, uh, I need to, boom, humble myself. You know what I need to do sometimes? And, and there are better ways of wording. I need to cut myself down to size. I need to sit Mike Bagwell over yonder in the corner somewhere and say, you're not as hot. You're not as special as you think you are. You are merely, you are merely a sinner who got born again by the goodness of God. You'd die and go to hell otherwise, Bagwell. Submit yourselves Therefore, unto God, hupo tasso this time, hupo to get under, put yourself under the sound of God's voice, put yourself under into obedience to God's commands, submit yourselves, therefore, to the Lord. If the Holy Ghost leads you. You merely salute and say, Yes, sir, I'm at your command. Your wish is my desire. You just ask me, Lord, and I submit yourselves, therefore, to God. But there's something else. Resist the devil. Resist the devil. Oh, let me take a minute and talk about that word devil. Diabolos. I guess is the way it would be pronounced. It, it is comprised of two Greek words, dia and balo. Balo gives us the word ball, B-A-L-L. -L. Balo means to throw. Dia means toward or through somebody. Let me tell you what the devil does. He throws accusations at you. He throws spitballs, except they're spitballs of temptation to sin at you. He, he tries to get you discouraged. He tries to get you to quit. He tries to get you not to go to church. He, try, he throws filth at you and hopes it'll stick. Resist that devil. Resist that deceiver. Resist your adversary. Let me look because it, it is the Holy Ghost uses a different verb here. Antihistamine. If you're a doctor, that's the word antihistamine. Antihistamine, stand against the devil. Oh, whoa, 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 brother. Back. Stand against the devil. Submit yourself to God. Don't you resist the devil unless you're submitting to God. If you're rebelling against God and sinning against God, I don't know if I'd try to resist the devil or not. He might stomp you and spit you out, the devil. But if you're obeying God, if you have submitted yourself set down, willingly obedient to follow his every command, then you can resist. anti his means stand against him. Oppose him. Go face to face with the devil. Don't you do it unless you've submitted to God, unless you're living in the middle of God's will. But if you have, resist that old devil. Now wait a minute, preacher. I don't know. Yes. Paul is writing to a young preacher boy one, one, one day and he says, flee youthful lusts. When the devil comes to you tempting, when the devil tries to get you to lust about some sensual thing, flee, run. Timothy, you're young in the faith, run from the devil. James is talking to some people who have learned to submit themselves to God and he didn't say this time he didn't say this time run from the devil resist him in the name of Jesus Christ devil get out of here through the power of the blood of the lamb Satan I bid you leave the premises resist the devil oh I don't know about that preacher resist the devil take the sword of the spirit which is the word of God 
take a jab or two at the devil, resist the devil, and he, 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 he will quit tempting, he will quit bothering you. We'll learn more in just a second. Jesus resisted the devil three times in what we call the 40 days temptation. Preacher, how did Jesus resist the devil? It is written. It is written. Three times. It is written. He quoted the two-edged sword of the Word of God. Take this devil and take this devil and take this devil. And when the Lord had sliced him real good three times, the devil departed from him, at least for a season. <laughs> Resist the devil. I'm overwhelmed by that command. And yes, I do need to tell you, these are imperative mood verbs. These are stark commands. Let's review Oh, He giveth more grace. Oh, I want to live for Him better. He'll give you the grace to do so. I want my prayers to be answered. He'll give you the grace to be persistent in prayer. Oh, I want to live separated from the world. He'll give you grace to be. Oh, I, 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 I want to do more for Him. He'll give you grace to work consistently for Him. He giveth more grace. Therefore, the Bible says God resisted the proud. He's quoting from the Old Testament. I'll tell you in a minute. God resisted the proud, gets in the face of the proud, rebukes the proud, will not condone the proud. In fact, antagonistically goes against the proud. But He gives grace. Gives and gives and gives grace. More grace. Greater grace. Hallelujah. Amazing grace. Manifold grace. He gives grace to the lowly to the humble. And then we get submit yourselves to God. I think I've covered that. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. And he will flee. From, resist him. And if you resist him as an obedient child of God, you've submitted yourself to him. And if you resist him through the blood of the Lamb, and if you resist him through the word of God, Revelation 12, there's a huge group. They resisted the devil. They overcame the devil by the blood of the Lamb. He can't stand the blood. The blood is the antidote. The, the blood is the krypton of the devil. He cannot handle it. He will flee. He will flee. Instead of me having to flee from the devil, if I submit to God and, and resist the devil, he'll have to flee from me. He will flee from you. That will flee, obviously it's a future tense verb. He will flee. If you resist him, he will flee. But it is a middle voice verb. He will flee and he'll never be the same again. He will flee and he'll say, boy, I got whooped that time. He will flee and he said, I've learned afresh and anew. I'm no match for the blood of Jesus or the two-edged sword of the Word of God. Knock a devil upside the head. Give him a black eye today. Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil. Stand up to him. And he will flee from you. Wow. Verse 8. Can we get verse 8 in? I'd like to. I had originally determined to discuss with you verses 6 through 12. And I decided a minute ago in there in, in my study sitting at the laptop, impossible. We're not going to have a 55-minute Bible study tonight. Impossible. We're going to cover what I can now, and then we're going to come back uh, in our next lesson and cover the rest of verses 6 through 12. And then verses 13 on, how amazing they are. I'm, I'm sort of itching to get to them. That'll be two lessons off now. Draw nigh to God. That is a command. Draw nigh to God. No, James, I just don't think I'll draw nigh to God. I'm, I'm doing pretty good. I, I'm all right. I don't have to draw nigh to God. Command. Draw nigh to God. It is an imperative, and it means literally this. Oh, my. Join yourself to God. Get just as near to God as you can. Draw nigh to God. Is anybody to whom I'm preaching, to whom I'm teaching today, and you'd like to get a little closer to God? That ought to always be our heart's plea. I've told you this before. I heard an old preacher. 
He said this, here is his definition of backsliding or being backslidden. doesn't have to be yours, but it's his. If there's ever been a moment I've been closer to God than I am right now, I'm backslidden. He said, if there's ever been a moment I've been closer to God than I am right now to that degree, from where I am now to the closest point of, he said, to that degree, I am backslidden. James might put an amen there. Draw nigh to God. Preacher, I don't know. Is God willing to? God is willing. It thrills God. It plays. He seeks people to worship Him, to fall on their knees. Draw nigh to God. Don't run from Him. Don't think that His will will be something detrimental. Draw nigh to God. Psalm 63, I believe it is. I would turn, but always time is an issue. Psalm 63. My soul followeth hard after thee. That is the psalmist saying, Oh God, I want you. I need you. I crave you. My soul followeth hard after thee. And in the same verse, Thy right hand upholdeth me. <laughs> Lord, I'm after you. I'm seeking you. Oh, God, I want you. I want you. I want you. You no sooner say, My soul followeth hard up, and his right hand upholds you. You tell him you want to get closer, he'll accommodate you. You tell him you want to snuggle up to him, his heart will warm even more. Smile will come on his face, and he'll say, If you want to draw nigh to me, oh, verse 8, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Now this is going to be corny. I'm a country boy. Snuggle up to God and He'll snuggle up to you. You go to bed tonight, pillow your head, and you, you didn't immediately fall off sleep. You start telling God how much you love Him and He'll just start telling you how much He loves you. Tell Him how you've enjoyed spending the day with Him and He'll say, oh, and I've enjoyed spending the day with Him. He will reciprocate. You'll never outlove God. You'll never out outspeak to God how you treasure Him with all your heart. Him that honoreth me, this is God talking. Him that honoreth me, I will honor. Draw not to, not to God and He'll draw. That line alone, that little proverb, is worth our whole time spent this evening studying the scriptures of truth. Drawn out of God, He'll draw out of you. That is a promise. Oh, 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 oh. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Let me look just to be sure. Oh, yeah. It is the catharsis verb of the New Testament. It, it means this. First of all, this verb for cleanse, it means like little boy's been out playing and he made some mud pies or something and, and uh, or he got out there with his little truck and he, he got in the mud puddle there and he's, you know, earth moving little piece of equipment. You got to go in and wash the dirt off your hands. Go in, wash your hands, Johnny. And he goes in and he washes his hands, uses that soap, best again, standing on his little stool there at the lavatory. Then he gets the towel down. Mama's taught him to put the soap back up, put the towel back Cleanse your hands. Did I make an announcement and get any agreement at all? Our hands get dirty in this old world. Our hands get so My heart has been washed in the blood of the Lamb, but my feet and my hands get dirty sometimes. I need to cleanse them. Preacher, how do you do that? Through the washing of the water by the Word of God. God's Word will cleanse my hands and my feet. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. No, Brother Bagwell, he's talking to sinners. He's talking to lost men. <laughs> you just got to know James. He's pretty rough spoken. He's talking to his church people. He's talking to Christians. But he's calling them sinners because he doesn't like the way they're living. He's calling them sinners because they have loose tongues. He's calling them sinners because they showed partiality toward a rich man and, uh, and abused the poor man. Get over here and sit down. Uh, he's calling them sinners because they don't have wisdom. He's calling them sinners because they fuss and fight all the time. He's calling them sinners because they won't. They... Cleanse your hands, you sinners. First John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. and cl Cleanse your hands, you Believers, you Christians who have erred 
erred so dangerously in your faith. Cleanse your hand. Command. It's a requirement. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Oh my, that word for hands. It literally gives us the English word chasm. What is a chasm? It's a pit. It's a hole. Hands. Look at there. The palm of my hand. That's a chasm. That becomes the Greek word for hand. Cleanse your hands. Why do you want your hands cleansed? Because I want to lift up empty hands and say, Lord, I need wisdom. I need grace. I need a little strength and power today. Cleanse your hands so that you can lift up clean hands and pure hands to Him. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts. Make, make holy. To make separate from the world. It's a different word than uh, the catharsis verb. Uh, it, it's a word for holy, as in Holy Spirit. Agia, it cleanse and purify, purify your hearts, ye double-minded. This time he didn't call them sinners. It's parallelism, ye double-minded. I guess if you're double-tongued, a lot of Christians are, a lot of Baptists are, I guess you'll be double-minded. Probably be. Do please, you, you'll probably be double hearted too, hypocritical. Look at this now. What, gentlemen? Cleanse your hands, purify your hearts. Watch, don't miss this. Clean up on the outside, but that won't do you any good unless you cleanse your heart. Clean up on the inside. There's a lot of practical truth in this part of the book of James. Purify your hearts, ye double-minded. James is trying to lead them from spiritual infancy. Watch my finger. All the way over to the place of spiritual maturity. They're not there yet. They got a long way to go. And if you studied uh, James so far with us regularly, you know what I mean. All the issues he's had to address, but he wants them to get there. And now, cleanse your, wash your hands, and then sanctify your hearts. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Purify your hearts, ye double-minded. It's just like he, like a machine gun. <laughs> He's just rattling off one set of instructions after another. Literally one command from God. After You can't read James without at least knowing how you ought to live as a Christian. That's as far as I'm going to go. I'm going to take up, we're going to take up tomorrow in the lesson that begins at verse 9, and we'll cover verses 9, 10, and 11, and 12. And the reason that I'm going into that is going to deal with something I call repentance, and I just don't have the time left to deal with it. May I review with you a second? He gives more grace. That's worth saying hallelujah. He gives me grace, more grace, and much grace. He giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, quoting Proverbs, God resisteth the proud. Oh, Lord, I don't want to be proud. I can't humble myself. And if I don't, God will humble me one way or another if I'm going to be used of him. God resisteth the proud. But he gives grace. Here we are, grace again. He giveth grace to the lowly, to the humble, to those who realize that they are merely sinners saved by grace. Verse 7, submit yourselves therefore to God. I'm sitting in a, in a wicker chair that Debbie's got two of them here on the little balcony. And uh, Lord, I'll submit to you. I'll sit down. I'll zip my mouth. I'll shut up and I'll listen and I'll learn and I'll obey. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God in every area of life every day as well. Mm. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil. Oh, I enjoyed telling you about to get in his face. Rebuke him in the name of the Lord. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And this is a victory that overcometh the devil, the world, even our faith. Hallelujah. If God be for us, resist the devil. If God be for us, who can be against us? 
through the blood of the Lamb, through the double-edged sword of the Word, resist the devil, and he'll run. He will flee from you. Oh, I'd love to see his dust going down the road. He'll come back. He'll be back. But he'll flee from you for that temptation. He will flee from you. And then verse 8. Draw nigh to God. Did you especially enjoy that? I hadn't got over it yet. Draw nigh to God. And he'll draw nigh. I knew it's cooler out here on the balcony than I realized and a little bit of a breeze has come up. I'd sure sort of like to draw up nigh to God and get under his wings, under the shadow of his wings, and let that big warm heart of his wrap me up right now. I can't do it literally. I can't do it physically, but I sure am doing it spiritually. Draw nigh to his word. He'll draw nigh to you. Get in your prayer closet and draw nigh to him, and he'll, he'll draw nigh to you. And then the negative. Cleanse your hands. Ye sinners, every one of us, when the meditation is over, should go to our place of prayer, get on our knees and say, Lord, what in my life, what area of my hands, my feet, my ears, my mind, what area of my life needs a bath, needs to be cleansed? Where do I need to get closer to you? Where do I need to live a more purified life? Purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Lord, you know what's in my heart. I want a clean heart. I want a pure heart. I want a heart dedicated, dedicated to living for thee. Is it Psalm 24? Who shall ascend unto the hill of the Lord? Who will abide in thy tabernacle? Don't you want to abide in his tabernacle? I sure do. Here's the answer. He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. And no doubt James is all over that verse. God resisted the proud, and I kept saying he's quoting from the Old Testament. And a minute ago, I added a little nugget to it. He's quoting from Proverbs. Listen, Proverbs 3.34, King James Version. God scorneth the scorners, but he giveth grace to the lowly. He resists the proud. He scorneth the scorners. It, literally, a scorner is somebody that makes a face. It makes a face at they're making a face at God, and God Almighty turns down, makes a face. He scorneth the scorners. He'll laugh when their destruction comes one of these days. He scorneth the scorners. He resisteth the proud, but he gives grace to the lowly. Actually, verse 7 gives two ways to resist the devil. Let me, let, let me show you that real, very quickly. I'm going to be over time. Put Submit yourself to God and resist the devil. You can't do one without the other. You can't resist the devil if you hadn't first obeyed God and submitted God. Submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he's gone. At least for right now. He's gone. What if he comes back? Submit yourself to God again, resist the devil again, and he'll be done. Boy, preacher, if I did that, I'd just be constantly submitting to God. Amen. Hallelujah. Wow. <laughs> I don't know if you are, but somebody called these verses a barrage of commandments. James is not through yet. James has uh, had an awful lot to say about humility. God resisted the proud and he gives grace. He's been talking about humility since chapter 1. And you know what? I'm just thinking, humility may be the solution to every problem in James. Humility may be the solution for me getting more wisdom. Humility may be the solution to me taming my tongue. Humility may be the solution for me not to mistreat the poor man and not to overly respect the rich. Humility may be the answer to me not bickering and fussing with my brothers and sisters. It may be the answer to me not being proud. In fact, in fact it is. It's the opposite of pride. Humility. Humility. Matthew 23, 12. It's James and Jesus again. Jesus said, Whoever will exalt himself shall be abased. And he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Draw nigh to God and He'll draw nigh to you. Ephesians 2.13 We can draw nigh 
we have been made near by the blood of Jesus Christ. I can draw nigh because of the blood. I can draw nigh because of the Savior who washed away my sins. Lehman Strauss, I glanced at him a minute ago on these verses. He calls these verses security through submission. Submit yourselves to God. Security. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. That sounds like security. Security through submission. Let's pray. Let's pray. Well, Brother Bagel, what are we going to pray tonight? Psalm 130. Long been one of my favorite psalms. I love to preach it. Listen. Out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive unto thee. I want to use those three word pictures right there tonight. Lord, out of the depths have I cried unto thee. I'm talking to somebody tonight, some class member. I just admire you for coming to, to our session tonight. You're discouraged. Some problem has hit you. Something is crumbling in your life. Out of those depths, out of that low place, keep crying. Out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord. And God answered his prayer out of the depths. It's not long he's shouting the praises because he cried out of the depths. Don't let the devil get you so discouraged you quit praying. Don't let him get you so down. That's his goal. So that you quit crying out to God. Oh my soul, why art thou disquieted? Why art thou cast down out of those depths? I'll cry out to God. O oh Lord, hear my voice. Let thine ears be attentive to me. Oh, I want to show you that one. The word let thine ears be attentive, it literally means to incline. Like God's up here and God's here in your prayer. Let thine ears be attentive, it means this. Incline your ear. It can even mean this. Cup your ear. Lord, I'm praying. Some of y'all been praying for a while on something. Ask God to make his ears attentive. Ask God to lean down. Ask God to do this as you plead and as you cry unto him out of the depths. I've cried. Lord, hear my voice. The verb is shama. The verb means not only to hear, it means to listen, and ultimately it means to obey. God, I beg you, would you answer my prayer? Would you grant my petition and let your ears be attentive? And then the psalm goes on and says, but Lord, I've sinned. Oh, doesn't the devil hit you over the head with that? Lord, I've sinned. And Lord, if you should mark iniquity, Verse 3, Lord, if you should write down all my sins, I'm sunk, it's done, I'm over with. Lord, I, I, I sinned and you washed away my sin. I know that, but Lord, I still sin, I still fail, I still have all the... Lord, if you should mark down my iniquities, nobody can stand, nobody could pray, nobody could come into your presence. But Lord, there's forgiveness with thee. That word forgiveness, there is pardon with thee. One time it means, Lord, you have spared me. I should have been in hell. You spared me. You forgave me through the blood of Jesus that I might reverence you, that I might worship you. Let's pray. Father, on behalf of somebody who's in the depths, who's lonely, discouraged, almost to the point of it seems like giving up, don't let them quit. Let that fire burn in their heart like it did in Jeremiah's. Don't let them quit. Oh, Lord, you've begun a good work in them. Perform it now. Perform it till Jesus comes. Don't let them quit. Out of the depths, let them cry out to you one more time. And, Lord, as they cry out, Lord, we all go through the depths as we cry out. Lean your ear in. Let your ear be attentive. Cup your ear, Lord. 
Listen to them like a father listening to a needy son or a needy daughter. Oh, let your ears be attentive to the voice of their supplications. Lord, save that soul today that's nearest hell. And Lord, encourage that Christian today who's nearest quitting, who's nearest to, to the point of absolutely losing hope out of the depths. Help them to cry unto you and hear their voice, I pray. And Lord, if there's somebody, you, they've got not a problem in the world, it's a cloudless sky where they live, hallelujah. But Lord, help us to remember this one. We will be in the pits. We will be in the depths someday. And just to keep on crying out unto you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Weeping may endure for a night. You're in the depths. Weeping may endure for a night. But it says joy will come in the morning. Jesus is coming again. Let me know something that particularly spoke to your heart tonight. Something that, or today, I'm recording it obviously in the daytime. Let me know what the Spirit of God revealed to you. What He used to uplift or encourage you and others of you. Preacher, I don't do a lot of that text and that type and that messengers. I don't do a lot of that. Just say I watched it. I watched it. And if you do none of it, stay with us. I think James gets more exciting every lesson. Let's study the Word of God together. We already know where we're going in our next lesson. We're going to, I don't know, I don't remember a lesson like this. I didn't get through. We're going to take up at verse 9 and uh, it's in my heart to go through verse 12. Hey, y'all stay in the Word. And if the devil gets you discouraged, hallelujah, keep on praying out of the depths.